movie this is from. We missed a boy's weight. I just remember that <laughs> sentence, but very much used in the same way. Did we? Uh, did we? So people will wander in. We'll get some humans. There'll be some. There it is first and foremost. My mom. The kind, oh, of, person I can, kind of person I can take Kelly That's home to perfect. meet. perfect. Yes. And I, know, I don't know what Kyle's showing off in the background there, but for a minute I, I thought it was something else. So, um, I don't know. A bat? I don't, it looks, could be a juggling club. That's what <laughs> I was thinking it could be. So it's exciting today. We have... Hey, who's on the show, Carrie? You know what? Why don't you tell them? Uh, so Kyle <laughs> Shannon is a guy who runs a company called Storyvine. And one of the things I liked about Kyle was uh, whenever I launched Story Leader, uh, Kyle was like, hey, we should totally talk about Storyvine. And every time I have a conversation like this with anyone else with story in the name, I fall asleep in the first 40 seconds. Um, but Kyle really impressed me, not only just because he's cool and he knows a lot about storytelling. Uh, that's about the two of three nice things I'll say about him. The other is that um wow that, i've never seen that before my screen's uh, camera's going yellow the other is that um kyle has this really cool software that does something i think business company organizations should should have uh you know in, in play kelly shibari i had to come speak at my conference the first time i think in 2009 at one of my inbound marketing summits and she came and answered a question that I had, which is she was she is an adult film star and model. And also uh, I said, well, you have the same kind of challenge that places like the Wall Street Journal have. Uh, news is free everywhere. How do you convince somebody that they should pay for news? Same thing with porn. How do you convince someone to pay for porn? And I was I looped Kelly into a conversation just the other day with Sugar Jones, who I hope is here. She said she'd come by. Um, and I we were talking about how do people monetize you know, in the new world. So it's really interesting. Our show thing, Carrie, has always been about alchemy. Like, how do we get two interesting people and, uh, you know, from very different uh, mindsets? And uh, we definitely have some people from some different spaces. I don't know, a video expert and an adult star. I feel like that makes sense. Well, I think, you know, one thing that uh, I asked Kelly about that, I said, what if this tech is really cool for porn? And uh, even though Kyle will make the case that it probably will be, um, there's a lot of people who try and fail to make tech that is cool for porn, it turns out. So. I feel like porn, is that industry is the one that tries everything first and figures out a way to make Absolutely. it useful. Absolutely. So, by the way, Kelly said this is as close as you get to like a, it's not like a safer work <laughs> click, so don't click oh, that. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> you uh, you com, you know, maybe yeah. don't Write this down with like a pencil. <laughs> Go yeah. All right, let's bring in Kyle first and uh, drag him into this storyline, and then I will uh, bother our dear Kelly after. So, hi, everybody. Hi, Rob. Did you? I did it. I hit the button. Hey, Kyle. Hello. So, um, you gave me the demo on Storyvine, and I wasn't expecting to like it, and I liked it. One of the things I, I liked is I know you commented, you're like, you went through a linear PowerPoint or whatever it was, a presentation, and you're like, uh, normally I hate those and stop people. And you're like, you're not cool with. So that was, thank you. I hate people's PowerPoint decks. I think you don't have so to tell boring. people that, by the way. You could just watch the thing. And if you are pleasantly no, surprised, because you I don't want to do it. I don't want to endure the slide. And yeah, I also exactly. want, you know, people thinking they're going to pitch me. I want them to know, oh, sh I better not bring a deck with me. Because, you know, what's a deck do? Deck is like, you know, masturbation for 26 slides and then finally something right. you want. And so, it's yeah. like, you know, we're so good. We won the industry. And, blah, 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 and you know. I'm never, just warming up the yellow card. That card yeah, is going to come out. Like I'm going to um, screen my finger later. Oh, Carol Alloloaf is here. It's her anniversary today. Happy anniversary. Happy wedding anniversary. This is exactly you. what you should be doing on your anniversary. Yeah, hanging out with us. Go to clubkellyshabari.com. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what you do later after your anniversary. That's right. <laughs> um, so listen, Kyle, Storyvine is, uh, you're going to explain it differently, but the thing I like the most is that, and it was on that one slide that I think was awesome, was uh, it takes the sort of velocity of user-generated content and the excitement right. and energy you can get out of user-generated content, and it takes the uh, most important structure parts of pro video and, and, and marries them in the middle. Do you want to talk as briefly as you can about how you put together the Storyvine that exists today? Yeah, sure. It's so the 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 epiphany that led to Storyvine was basically when YouTube first came out. One of the things I recognized was um, most of the content on it sucked, and and why it sucked we was because people were mistaking hitting the record button for storytelling, 
And so the epiphany I had was, you know, if, if you could provide someone with a framework, a basic sort of beginning, middle, and an end story structure that they could follow along with, it would make it much easier for people to tell their stories. Kind of the, the epiphany was short form video is going to be powerful. Um, the, uh, you know, storytelling is harder than it should be, and everyone has a story to tell. So is, is there a way we could democratize video storytelling? So Storyvine has an app that guides an end user through telling a specific story. Story. So instead of just hitting the record button, we actually prompt someone how to tell a story. So let's say it's a patient story and you want that patient to talk about their diagnosis journey. You know, step one, introduce yourself and you know how long you've had the disease. You know, step two, when were you diagnosed and how did that feel? Step three, how did you treat it? So we literally walk someone through telling a story um, and then all those clips go up to the cloud and sitting up in the cloud is an empty shell of a video and it gets automatically edited together in five minutes. So fully automated editing, but but it's all based on the premise of breaking a story into little segments and walking someone through how to tell their story. So they don't have to get a degree in writing to be able to say, here's what it's like to be diagnosed with this horrible thing or whatever, you know, whatever the story might be. Right. Now, one example you showed me that was a you know real world example is uh, when Pete Buttigieg was still trying to run. Uh, you showed this thing where you basically and, and this is the part I want to focus on. So there's you had these four layers. You know, explain this to me after I make this horrible version of that. That's OK. Uh, That's basically, good. you ask good questions. The questions then get filled. So, so someone takes their camera or whatever, usually their phone, and they just shoot a thing. Hey, I'm Kyle. Hey, I'm Kyle right. from Texas. And then uh, you get a bunch of those in a row. And then you make another clip that says, I voted for Pete. Uh, you know, I'm voting for Mayor Pete because uh, he has really nice socks and whatever <laughs> they say. And then, you know, you yeah. get a lot of those. And then you get a bunch of different little clip answers. So then you can make like those, uh, you know, collage kind of videos that you, you are want to see where it's like, hi, I'm Kyle. I'm Kerry. I'm Chris. I'm Kelly. You know, mm -hmm. and, and they kind of go through that thing. I'm voting for Pete. I'm voting for Pete. I'm voting for Pete because, right, you get that like great repeat effect. But 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 your system does this in a lot of ways. So first, what are those four things that I can't remember in that order? And then let's talk about your database for a minute. Okay, great. So the 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 the, the kind of the first thing is that idea that Storyvine is a hybrid product that lives in the space between professional video and UGC. The kind of three legs of the stool that are the technology. The first one is guide, guided capture, so it's the guidance. So it's it's those prompted questions that show up in the app, and the app tells you hold your phone this way, put your head in this dotted outline. So it literally tells you how to frame everything, and then it coaches you what to do. So that's leg one of a three-legged stool. Leg two is we call auto magic editing. So so basically, sitting up in the cloud is pre-designed, pre-edited video. And that's our whole technology is based on there's there's a joke, there's there's a saying in video production um, called we'll fix it in post. Like no matter what you've screwed up, you can fix it in post, right? And so with Storyvine, we kind of have this joke, we can fix it in pre, because everything's pre-designed, the video is pre-designed, the story is pre-designed, all that needs to be filled in. It's like mad libs for video. All so pause right there because that's super big. Like when you were saying all the things you said, I wrote only one note on my piece of paper because I'm uh, a really bad note taker. All uh, I wrote was we'll, we'll fix it in pre. Yeah. Because to me, <laughs> that's the hero expression, right? Because what you're saying is it's not going to be, you know, you're not going to deal with it after the fact. It's going to be hit hard right up front. So. And that's that that piece of it. People that understand video production are the ones that have the hardest time getting their head around Storyvine because what they're used to is let's get as much coverage as possible, right? Let's shoot thirty minutes of video that we know we're going to edit down in two minutes because somewhere in there's going to be, you know, with Storyvine, we're we're deciding up front what we want that end video to be, and then we're saying what, you know, little sound bites do we need to be able to tell that story? And those are the things we prompt for. So we flip video production upside down. So guided capture is one, automated editing is two. And then the third leg of the stool, and this is kind of where you're headed, the, the database, everything that you're capturing ends up in a database, right? So um, you've got the, the fully edited video with all the graphics and all those clips stitched together, but you also have access to each individual segment that was recorded. So when you know you know that clip one is where the person introduces themselves and clip two is where they talk about why they support Pete and clip three is where they talk about their issue and why it's important to them. So, so as a video editor, you can go into that database and just pull sound bites very, very efficiently. You know, you know, you know, you like these four people and you want to get the segment where they, you know, say go vote for Pete. You know, you can go do that very, very easily. 
Susan's so, a video producer and she wants to know more. Yeah, yeah. And which you can follow up with Kyle after this. Um, but no, one thing I want to ask about uh, Kyle to this effect is we both had, uh, you know, in, the, in our conversation, it was kind of funny. It's a Goldilocks kind of story because UGC people don't understand how to edit things in a way that makes it, you know, useful enough. And pros don't understand the value of doing it this format in this way where you mm -hmm. just shoot what you need. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> they, they would rather make a lot of poop and sift through for the corn. And you say, why don't we just get some corn? And I think yeah, that's and, a, that's and it's difference. also there's there's an interesting thing with Storyvine that I've kind of learned over the years. It doesn't corn in the poop got the yellow card. That was I guess good. so. You know, I don't know if you want to use that as your next tagline. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're we're just the corn, none of the, all the corn, none of the poop. All corn, no poop. That's it. TM, TM. <laughs> uh, <laughs> One of the things we found, what, what Storyvine is really good for is not, if you want to tell one story really, really well, that's traditional video production. But if you want to do something like a customer testimonial, well, they're always the same, right? The customer testimonial is always like, here's when I became a customer, here was my awesome experience, and you should definitely go buy this thing, right? So it's always, you know, a lot of stories are the same kind of recipe. So, so Storyvine is very good at replicable stories. So if you've got the same kind of thing you're telling over and over and over again, that's what Storyvine's good at. And it's the other thing that you and I talked about, Chris, is um, a lot of the social media apps, a lot of the UGC video apps are very much about sort of that real time moment. It's, it's, it's much more informal. Like I want to say something, hit the record button, get it out to the world. Storyvine is actually a co-created piece of media where the organization says, here's the kind of story I want you to tell. And I'm going to create the framework for you to tell it. So here's the story I want you to tell on my terms. Are you willing to do that? And then if someone is, they come in and they go, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to do a custom you know, testimonial for your company. And then they follow the little recipe and, and they are just, all their job is to do is to authentically share their experience following those little prompts. And then the video that produced is this kind of collaboratively created piece of content, but it's very intentional storytelling. It's not as informal as just hit the record button and go. You're, you're sort of signing up to say, I'm willing to tell my story on behalf of that organization or movement or company or whatever it might be. So um, I do want to skip backwards a little bit into the Kyle Shannon origin story. Shortly after you were bitten by the radioactive spider, you <laughs> did, you have a background. I mean, you had agency stuff, agency.com and all that. You have a background in storytelling. And one of the things that I kind of posted when I was talking about this, this conversation today is a lot of companies say they want storytelling. A lot of companies uh, agree that story is useful. I mean, in my talks about story leader, I can get every leader in a room to nod and not every Everyone leader nods. in a room to spend the money. Yeah. Um, but you decided, you know, that you were going to take your storytelling knowledge and codify it in software. Basically, you can't not do it this way, essentially, because you've probably right. been selling one-offs forever. What was that epiphany like? Yeah, that was that was huge. Well, it's actually been 15 years in the making. I was thinking about this since our conversation last week. I started out, I got a degree in acting. So I started out learning how to tell other people's stories. Then I decided, oh, I'll write myself an acting career. Wrote seven screenplays and decided to write my own stories. Then I started an online magazine where I was, you know, um, curating other people's stories. Um, then I did agency.com where I was talking, you know, telling the stories of big brands in an interactive environment. And so what, what Storyvine is, is I realized that I create something that helps lots of other people tell their stories. Um, and, and the basic idea, the, the original idea, I started a non-automated version of this in 2006 called Episodic Studios that was an abject failure. But the idea was if you could templatize shows, um, you could replicate them and scale video production. So I was pitching NASCAR about doing fan generated shows. I was pitching CNN about doing, um, you know, political coverage at every level of politics. Um, and then I got my first job with New Line Cinema, which was super cool. And it was entertainment content. And I'm, ha I'm, I'm in the sort of first half of my first day where I had flown all this equipment and gear out to LA to, to film my first thing. 
And I had one of those arrested development moments where I was like, oh my God, I've made a terrible mistake. I realized as long as you're manually filming someone with gear, manually dealing with those massive files that are created and manually editing, it doesn't matter how templatized it is, it doesn't scale. So, so the kind of the first thing I learned was you literally can't scale video production if you're doing it manually. And so I shut the company down. Like I'd spent a year and a half and a lot of money like putting a putting company together only to realize when I got my first paid job, I'd shut it down because it just, it wasn't viable. Um, and then Storyvine is that idea of, of like, well, what if you could automate everything? And then, and then, you know, you can, but it's not based on AI, right? It's not based on technology figuring out what was said. It's based on Aristotle, right? Here's a basic story framework, literally like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, like the beginning, right. middle, and end of the story. You spoon feed that framework and then let just, just let people talk. But yeah, you have to follow the recipe. So Storyvine, if nothing else, is kind of like a recipe box for video storytelling. And then you sort of pick the recipe or as the company, you get to design your recipes. You put them out to the world, people tell their stories, and then you as the organization get to curate those stories. Kyle, would this work for someone who's interested in monetizing their content, like perhaps a lot of people who are now wanting to be in the adult industry, but are finding it difficult, <laughs> barriers to entry, to have actual production value to their stuff? Could you theoretically yeah. use it for anything? Yeah, you can theoretically use it for anything. Like I said, it, it's it's better at the the replicable stuff. But we've had kind of an internal quasi joke. I don't know. For a porn lot is pretty formulaic. I don't know when the last no, time you no. looked. <laughs> so, yeah, what we've talked about was was you know we've sort of jokingly talked about, but kind of half seriously. You know, we could easily put together the equivalent of porn maker, right? And porn maker is you know step one, you know, film the awkward introduction where the delivery guy shows up at the door, and step two, you know get into it, you know, by the time you get to step six, you know, there's your money shot, go. So so you could absolutely walk someone through, and, and that's the kind of thing, people that understand storytelling understand that there's a structure, I mean, you've put on this show, there's a whole structure for when you throw yellow cards and how you lay people out and who you bring in, right? There, there's, right. that was, the, the whole impetus behind Storyvine was, listen, there's, there's an existing format for television sitcoms. There's an existing format for one hour shows and two hour movies. No one had done that short form video. And so the idea of Storyvine is it's taking basic story structure. If you know nothing about storytelling, fine, just answer questions and a video is made. If you do know about storytelling, you can sort of recognize it. Ah, that's a little mini, you know, hero's journey. I get it. So, so yeah, you can apply that to porn. You can apply that to a nonprofit. You, you can, you know, uh, we've talked to a number of religious. Anything where the plot is really important. <laughs> I get it. Well, no, not necessarily because I was just thinking about, so Paul runs, Paul's, you know, I can't even remember the number. He's like tasted over a hundred thousand wines or something like that. He runs a big wine or, uh, organization and does a lot with uh, tastings and, and those kinds of events. And so you can imagine the sort of UGC see intern input of that is, Hey, I tried this and Oh, I, you know, I've been told for years that I should try a Malbec and blah, blah, blah. And so he could have based on wine types, based on people types, based on whatever. I think what Kyle's platform does well is that, and we didn't, I didn't really get my question in about it, about the database, but like you can thread and, and curate this in a lot of different ways. Once you have the raw content. Mm -hmm. Total. Well, and in fact, I don't know if I told you this, but you just set up. So we're launching our first self-service product right after Labor Day. And so, so Storyvine right now is a bespoke product, right? As an organization, you sign up, we custom build templates for you. It's very hands-on. The product we're launching after Labor Day is called Storyvine Now, and it's pre-built template kits. And one cool. of the kits that we're building, it's a set of four different kits for craft wine, beer, distilleries and food and huh. the kit will have three templates in it and so the craft wine template will be a customer testimonial so like here's why i like this particular wine um a tasting like a wine tasting template so you know the someone at the org can do wine tastings or customers could and then a meet the staff template so here's the vintner or here's the marketing assistant whoever you want to meet from the thing but the whole idea it with storyvine now is you swipe your credit card upload your logo you've got access to those three templates and you go make as many videos as you want can you do that while so, tipsy? So thank you for <laughs> like seeing how that. many glasses of malbec in can i be yeah, exactly still do this and and you know you can have a lot of fun with that especially brands that have you know, passionate followers, you can leverage that passion. 
and say, hey, would you be willing to do this? Yeah, I'd be willing to do it. Okay, here's a tool. Just download this app. You know, we've signed you up for that template and just answer the questions and you're off to the races. And what's cool is because people are coming in knowing that they're they're going to tell a specific kind of story, they tend to be like ready for it. And like we've had very few people go off the rails. It's, you know, sort of back to the the uh, the, the porn maker thing. One of the early, you know, sort of pieces of feedback I got when I was starting Storyvine was every, everyone said, oh, you're going to get all these junk shots and, you, you know, you'll have all this inappropriate content. And the reality is we've had almost none. Because people are coming in intentionally to say, I'm telling my patient journey or I'm coming in to do a customer testimonial. Right. And I think one of the reasons people get sophomoric on video is that they don't want to look stupid. So they do something really Wait, stupid. Wait, isn't sophomoric stupid? I thought sophomoric no, was no, no, no. It is. What you're going to say is that they're, they're cutting themselves off at the past. They're doing it exactly. for themselves. They, they, they don't want to look silly, so they just do something ridiculously silly because then they can just forgive that. But what people don't want to do is go in and, and talk about whatever, being diagnosed with a disease and just like, where do I start? I don't want to feel mm -hmm. stupid. So part of the philosophy of Storyvine is you don't have to think about anything. Just introduce yourself from where you live. Oh, okay, I can do that. And then the person can do as many takes as they want on that little segment before they move on to the next. So the whole idea is lower the anxiety for the story maker, the person telling their story, um, and then and then dramatically increase the quality of the storytelling and the consistency of it. You know what else works for that is wine. Wine. Yeah, yeah. we can do that. <laughs> Reduce the anxiety. Right. Again, that's why I think that, that kit's going to work good. <laughs> Kyle Shannon runs Storyvine, and you can check out a lot more about it at storyvine.com. You can find at Kyle Shannon everywhere on the Twitters. His company is at Storyvine Inc. Go find that as well. Kyle, if you can stick around, do. If you can't, I get will. the hell out of here. Either way, I'm kicking you backstage nice. because I have the <laughs> If you can't, that's a shame, and we're very sad. Yeah, we like it when you stick around because we do sort of a four-person panel near the very end. And I mean, like, think about it. Steve Garfield from stevegarfield.com is here, so why would you leave? Now. I wouldn't. I mean, I'm here. I'm sticking around. And Kelly's here. So it's a party. Hey, Kelly Shabari, how are you? Uh, hi, I'm good. It is I'm, super early. It's it, it's it early is. even for porn hours. Under normal well, circumstances, we'd probably just still be awake from the night before. But It'd be the night before still, right? Huh? I mean, it, it would be the night before still in right. some ways, right? Because yeah. usually it's... Uh, you kind of get your hours sleep in the in the vampire days, you know, like in the late mornings or something. Yeah. Well, in the in the, in the years before quarantine, because <laughs> it feels like it's been years, True. Um, we would be doing an appearance that would go late into the night. And then if somebody said, oh, you need to be on a podcast at, you know, seven in the morning Pacific time. <laughs> F you. Like, that's what the answer to that is. So um, but since we've been in quarantine, I actually did get some sleep. <laughs> So um, one of the, th you know, I guess we have to kind of address the Kyle thing, you know, and also, you know, Carrie saying that, you know, porn is formulaic. Porn's changed a lot over the years. Porn has really gone through, I mean, the the, the halcyon days of the 70s, for instance. Oh, sorry. I don't watch as much as you. So. Well, yeah, well, I think I haven't seen the evolution. It's very telling listening to you guys talking because I was like, oh, it's, this is such a generational conversation. Um, yes. and, and everybody who is like probably in their early 20s is listening to that portion going, no. <laughs> Um, I mean, we, we still have studios that make, you know, what you would consider formulaic porn with the storyline, you know, like the pizza boy comes to the door. Like that's that storyline's never, ever going to go away because it's something that as consumers, everybody's gotten so used to. Like that's the buildup, you know, um, that's the time where you can go and get whatever it is that you need to get ready to do whatever you need to do when you watch porn. Um, but uh, because of things like the original Vine and TikTok and Instagram and Facebook Live and you gotta get and, right to the point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just it's it's less about building up the story. It's the understanding that most porn consumers don't need twenty minutes to get where they need to go when they use porn. Right. <laughs> I was just watching American <laughs> Werewolf in London, and they had this part where they there's it's a really famous scene where they're sitting in an adult theater, and mm -hmm. you know the guy's seeing all the people that he mauled. And uh, but on the screen, the movie makes no sense, <laughs> and I forgot that completely. <laughs> so there's like a guy comes in naked, and he realizes he's in the wrong room. Like he's all mad at the woman, and then he looks <laughs> at her face, and he's like, "Oh, sorry." <laughs> right. And that stuff keeps happening, and I had forgotten about it 
completely. Yeah, old school porn really was theatrical. You know, you used to go to theaters in San Francisco. You know, there were um, people that owned adult movie theaters that you actually paid a ticket and went and sat in. Um, in the industry, we used to call them raincoaters because most of them wore raincoats when they went in for obvious reasons. Um, and now everybody seems to purchase their porn on not even on a, a, a TV. You know, um, most of them use their phones, you know. Um, so it means that shorter content is, you know, more instant gratification is uh, is even more instant than it used to be. Right. Well, but, you know, how is it that sad for women everywhere? Right. Well, and also, like, the kind of adult entertainment has changed, right? Where for like the 70s and the 80s, most of, and, and probably well into the early 2000s, most porn was meant for men, uh, meant for cis, you know, cisgender heterosexual men. And porn these days is for everybody, you know, um, if you want to find something that involves purple people eaters who like eating bananas, you'll find that, you know, <laughs> um, you'll find furries, you'll find a little bit of everything. So you're able to find what it is that turns you on. Um, and so that actually means that we now have even more creators than before, which is great. There's a related to that, and I, I was rushing to try to look it up, but I'm not the researcher that Carrie is. Pornhub just announced, speaking of the fact that uh, the difference between women's satisfaction and male satisfaction, uh, Pornhub was doing this project where they were they were kind of altering their site a little bit to kind of kind of denote how men tend to not be in it for helping the woman find their satisfaction you know, should that be the configuration? And they were, they were trying to draw attention to that. Like, Hey guys, you got to up your game a little bit, which is, I find interesting, especially given that this is, you know, people's external view of Pornhub is not to be an educator of, you know, uh, equalitive sex for well, instance. Yeah. I mean, and, and tube sites in general, when it comes to the adult industry are not necessarily looked upon as positive no. things. We don't tend no. to mention those sites, Chris Brogan, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um but even even those a, a lot of the bigger tube sites have changed their marketing um, and monetization tactics in terms of how they work with creators. Where right. when they first came into the scene, um, you know, a lot of studios ended up having to shut down. A lot of independent producers ended up having to close up shop and look for another line of work um, because when piracy becomes the norm, it you know, and, and as a whole, the, you know, consumers don't particularly care for creators, then, then it hits us in our pocket, right? But right. even companies like the one you mentioned um, have developed like a model program where they actually work with creators and they actually monetize off of ad revenue. And so you, you know, so creators who use that platform through their service will actually get paid through like views, which they never used to do before. So right. that's, Definitely, um, you know, even those tube sites, which we, you know, like you, it's definitely generational. Old school porn people absolutely hate tube sites and I don't blame them. Um, whereas I've had conversations with like these 22, 23 year old content creators who use that platform specifically to drive traffic and specifically to monetize. Um, you know, it's definitely a, a big culture war going on between the generations in the industry. But um, but some people are coming around. You know? Kelly, we had um, pro wrestler Taylor Hendricks in, and she's youngish. I can't remember her age. It was like 22, 23, 24. She, um, she was very different than her sort of protege past WWE people insofar as, you know, you trust, you trust the entity to bring you your, your bread and butter. And she couldn't, you know, no one can anymore. And that's, I think, also true of the, the new generation of people making adult content. Oh, um, it's changed dramatically since the very, you know, your very first time making revenue on you know on your work it's very different how you have to kind of work to get a buck right now and it's a lot harder is what i understand can you talk through a little bit about the kind of revenue opportunity yeah, absolutely. I mean, when and i actually was a late bloomer i didn't get into the industry i was in, until i was in my mid-30s because before that i actually worked in kyle's line of work in mainstream hollywood as but as a production designer um and the only reason i kind of stepped into the adult industry is because we had a giant writer strike and I needed to find, you know, not just me, but like a bunch of other people needed to find something else to do so we wouldn't cross a picket line. Um, but back then it was still, you know, pretty much the studio system. You went, you were hired by a, a, an agent represented you or you, um, uh, 
or you had a studio book you, you went to set, you had like a suitcase full of clothes that they could pick out of. You did your scene. You knew exactly what was going to happen that day. And then you went home and you either got paid the same day or you got a paycheck in the mail in a, in a couple of weeks afterwards. Um, but it was very similar to what's considered a commercial buyout in mainstream production, where you get paid a, a lot more than what you would normally get paid as an actor, because then the studio owns all of your content. Whereas now, you know, it's, it's very cool on one hand, because you have all of these different platforms that you can use and this amazing new tech, like you shoot pretty much anything on a phone these days. So you don't necessarily need the equipment. You don't necessarily need the platform um, of a studio to, to promote your work. But at the same time, there's also now this giant learning curve where you need to figure out how to use the equipment that you've been given because there's no school right. for porn. Um, and there's, um, and, and because there are no studios, but a glut of platforms, you know, OnlyFans is, is only one of like a dozen other platforms and they all offer something a little bit different. Um, and so it's, it's very important not to just figure out how you're creating content, but also how your fans want to consume that content. I think it's very similar to music um, these days. Like, do you use Spotify? Do you use Pandora? Do you use SoundCloud? And why do you pick, pick one platform over the other as a consumer? As a creator, you also need to know why your fans choose one platform over the other and see if you can kind of work with those platforms to give them the content that they want. So it becomes a much more interactive experience than it ever was when I was working with studios. So the way I talk business a lot of times in, in these kind of revenue uh, collection methods is it's it's a lot more like tapas. You have to get a lot of little bites, yes. you know, to equal your meal. And I must be kind of tricky. One other thing I thought about when you were talking about the the sort of younger generation of creators is that they're not unlike YouTubers and Twitch streamers in that sort. Absolutely. Would you say that there's a lot more in common with that than there is how you got started? Oh, yeah. and And I think also... You know, the quarantine's definitely changed. I mean, I know that that's a topic for everybody on every podcast, but the quarantine's yeah. definitely changed how we not only consume adult entertainment, but also how we create it. Um, one of the things that I had heard, I had taken a four-year sabbatical. So for me, getting back into porn this year, not only is like the worst timing on the planet, but is also um, the the platforms that, that are available to me to use have also kind of shifted the way they offer their content as well. For right. example, like OnlyFans, my understanding of OnlyFans was that it was supposed to be an add-on experience for consumers on top of like regular, like old school membership sites where you sign up for like a monthly subscription and you get like a couple of um, professionally produced scenes per week. But OnlyFans and those kind of like four fans type sites were supposed to be these like add-on things so that if a fan is a fan of your membership site, he could then sign on to your OnlyFans for mm -hmm. a glimpse into your day to day, like a lot of behind the scenes, a lot of, oh, she's doing yoga today or, oh, she's making lunch today. It was more supposed to be for that. So it was a much more interactive experience with fans. Whereas now with the studios kind of shut down, everybody's OnlyFans has also turned into their membership sites if they don't have one already. Right. Um, but on membership sites, you don't have the interaction that you have with fans. You don't have like a chat feature. You don't have the ability to do a live show. Um, and this is kind of what I mean about different platforms offering different solutions is, you know, OnlyFans offers a live streaming capacity, but they don't offer a way for you to sell DVDs or merch, right? But then another platform would offer merch opportunities, but no camming platform. So right now, like, especially ever since the quarantine, there's just been more and more websites that have been launching that not necessarily compete with OnlyFans, but go, hey, you see what OnlyFans has. Well, do you see what this other site has? Well, we've merged it and now you can actually, you can only have one place. Um, I recently had a chat with a website called peep.me and they're, they're going with a much more inclusive um, uh, feminist approach, I guess, uh, is, is their platform, which is that the CEOs profit share just as much as the content creators. Um, right. And so much more of a collective. So now, so again, you're having all these different platforms that cater to different communities within the creator community, which is great. 
It's interesting too that uh, to your point about the sort of different people creating the different sites, uh, and you'd said earlier about like just that there's there's something for everyone out there. It's interesting that with that you get, for instance, uh, you know, sites that have an LBGTQ uh, forward kind of agenda, or sites that uh, you know it used to be that uh, porn, like you said, was almost entirely cis male, you know, uh, product, and that you know, for instance. Uh, trans uh, porn was never any real thing for a long time. The documentary Circus of Books talking about, you know, the first adult bookstore uh, on the West Coast of, of any real merit that, you know, that became a social scene as well, uh, oh, you know. And, and even assuming that trans porn automatically means trans women. That's correct. You know, That's there's correct. now, there's been a huge experience of people who are trans men also now right. being creators. And so in a weird way, it's, it's, it's porn has actually been very big in the acceptance movement, um, at least behind the scenes. So our, our friend, Steve Garfield from stevegarfield.com had popped up this one, Carrie. Uh, I was hired to do some, I'm not touching that button, Carrie. I did uh, it. I, was, I did. You missed it. Do it, it. again. I no. want to read it out loud. No, I'm, I'm touching. I'll cover no. her entire body. It's fine. <laughs> her face included. <laughs> Not the last time she heard that. It was, right. I was hired to do some. If your kids have to editing. cross through, have them come next. <laughs> From XHBO documentary, Real Sex Presents Porn 101. The video editor in the film they were documenting did not show up, so they asked me to fill in. And that's how I got my start <laughs> in porn. I, you know, that's a good jump question to ask you the question of. Uh, Stop how it. How much of this is. How, well, you didn't touch the, how much of this is ad hoc, you know, how much of people getting to this career is ad hoc, because oddly, I would say that probably more people aspire to this in a way that they couldn't in the 70s, 80s and 90s, meaning this is a path now that wasn't available. Or do people just land there because someone said they should be a model? Oh, I think I think it's like every 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 person has a different story on how they got in. You know, some people got in because you know, their boyfriend or their partner wanted to get into porn and wanted a scene partner. And they right. said, oh, you know, or they wanted to create like a like a Zach and Miri kind of situation of like just creating porn for themselves. And then it kind of goes viral. Um, it's, you know, um, I, I, I wouldn't say that there's actually just one kind of person that gets into porn, you know, and especially now with all these content creator sites that allow not safe for work content, you now have safe for work content creators using the same platform. So now you have musicians and chefs and yoga instructors using sites like OnlyFans um, because, because it's a payment. It's less about, it's less about the platform. O oftentimes it's more about the payment processing um, is when you, when you're say for instance, a yoga instructor, like if you're a safe for work you know, not an adult entertainer, and you want to start your website to have an online portal for people to sign up to your yoga classes. So you're not just teaching yoga classes in your in your suburb, right? Um, you need to apply for Visa and MasterCard to be able to take your payments, right? And so a lot of people will use a website like CC Bill, um, which is adult friendly, but it's also not uh, uh, also uh, mainstream friendly. Um, right. If you didn't, and if you go through that process, it ends up costing you an easy three to five thousand dollars just to get started. You know, whereas like you can go to like a site like OnlyFans or just for fans or a peep.me and launch same day. And all the payment processing is already there. The only thing that you need to figure out with all these different platforms is which platform takes what cut. So currently OnlyFans takes a 20% cut. So you get to keep 80%, wow. which is profoundly high. Um Foxy.me, I think, has uh, a Foxy.co has an 83% payout. Peep.me has a 90% payout. Um, it's so different from before all these platforms came out, where like the standard understanding as an adult entertainer is if you work with a webmaster, it was 50 50. 50 50, yep. You know, and they did wow. all the marketing and everything and all the hosting of the website and everything for you, but you only got to keep 50% of what you got from your fans. Um, a platform like OnlyFans or Peep.me really is good because not only can you start right away, you don't need as much equipment. You don't need to invest as much. If you try it for like a month or two and it really doesn't work out or six months and it really just doesn't work out for you, you can drop it and you don't feel like you've lost any money because there's technically no investment money involved in using those sites. The mechanics of payment are really important though. There's actually been calls for credit cards to freeze payments for porn sites and stuff. Yeah. It's not easy 
to well, get we, even people want to give you their money for stuff, right. which is like not a given. It's yeah, hard to I mean, make I it happen. Had, uh, an experience with a fan who was like, I don't know what's going on with my credit card, but it's not going through on OnlyFans. So then I had to find a different portal that accepted tips and go, well, can you use this? And um, OnlyFans was eventually able to get back to him because they're inundated with customer service requests too. Um, so he was able to, you know, fix the problem that he has. So he was, he didn't have to go to another platform, but as content creators, we have to have those backup in case something happens with our fans as well. Kelly, I think that not a lot of people would think about, well, I, I think there's a lot of sort of presumption on what they think your life is like when you're not doing your actual job. I think they think that you just, you know, walk around looking for sex all day and like, you know, your spare time is on all the sex websites and all that. But, you know, knowing you for as many years as I have, I mean, you are into the same stuff all my nerd friends are, you know, nerd stuff notwithstanding, but like, you know, tech futurism, uh, you know, where, where products and services are going, what kinds of things are, you know, political stuff, everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's so strange because so many people haven't really met someone who has your career. Uh, right. They don't, they don't realize, you know, the kinds of things you might talk to a person like you outside of your job. Right. Well, that's, you know, when you work for studios, that's, that's definitely the case. You're only presented to the fans in a way that the studios want to present you, which is a, a hypersexual person that wants to go out and that's, that's their 24 seven lifestyle. But when you actually talk to the people in the industry, you realize that when, and, and, and you get this a lot from like, you know, performers who are, are new to the industry first, they'll be like, oh, I want to live the porn star lifestyle when the reality of a porn star lifestyle is literally getting up at six o'clock in the morning and working until probably one or two in the morning. Um, and you're, and you're managing everything, whether it's your content creation, your marketing, your PR, your social media presence, um, you know, especially these days, like hiring, booking your own co-stars, uh, you're doing all of that yourself. So that takes up so much of your day. <laughs> it's so what's not dating. Like you must just be like, can we just oh, watch dancing date. with the stars? I, I don't date. Don't want. Um, yeah. My, and some, and some performers do, you know, um, some performers escort, some performers date, some performers go like me go when I'm performing, I'm performing. I don't mix business and, and my personal life. So, yeah, a again, it's, it's, it takes all kinds. Every single performer is a little bit different. Um, which is which is fantastic for consumers because you can like get, get whatever you want whenever you are looking for it. So, and there's been I mean I think we talked about this briefly one time, uh, and I've talked about it with others. There's a, I, I read this article that says that there's people who are now just looking for intimacy more than porn. There's a whole like sort of class of young Japanese workers who they're so tied to their business that they don't really have time for a traditional girlfriend. So they kind of pay for you know, a, a much more wholesome version of the phrase girlfriend experience. Oh, well, that happens here in the States too. Um, there are giant industries uh, with people who are focused more on their careers than, than starting a family right away. Uh, firemen in particular uh, work like a 24 on 48 off shift. Um, they're really concentrating, like every fireman I've ever met has been this way. They're really focused on on going up the ladder, so to speak, um, and uh, are not necessarily interested in getting married or having kids and having those obligations. Um, and so while they're waiting, they'll look for a girlfriend experience as opposed to a real girlfriend. And does that uh, cost more or less? Oh, well, that's interesting. It, well, it, that, that depends. I mean, if you, you know, if you talk, if you get, if you court somebody and you get married and you have kids that comes with a certain, um, dollar amount over the course of your lifetime. If you don't want to go that way and you instead want to uh, hire an escort or um, have a girlfriend experience that's virtual online with either a cam girl or these days with people like on sites like OnlyFans, um, you can do that. And it really depends. Do you want to, would you much rather spend, and, and these are like ballpark numbers, would you much rather spend two to three hundred dollars uh, for an hour of your virtual girlfriend's time once a week, or do you want to spend the same kind of money and you know exactly what you're getting and she's giving you exactly what you want, or do you want to spend that kind of money um, and wine and dine a girl that you met on OkCupid? I mean, it's it's a different goal. It might not give you anything at all. 
<laughs> you might not do it at all, but, but if your goal is to get married and to have children, an adult entertainer might not be the person that you're seeking that from, and it probably shouldn't be who you're seeking that from. Um, so depending on what your goal is. I mean, I, I personally think the dollar amount ends up being about the same. Over the <laughs> it's really interesting to think of the dollar and cents uh, of relationships in that way. But, you know, as time progresses and as there are more ways to look at you know, the construct of a relationship. I mean, it's not as weird as it used to be. Kyle, we dragged you back in, buddy. You're, you're, uh, you're for, still forefront front here. here. You're here and alive. Glad you are. Thank you for sticking around. You. Um, you both have a mutual appreciation of technology and where it goes. What has the uh, pandemic and the lockdown and the extended realizations that have stemmed from it. What has it meant for either of you? Kyle, maybe you first, I guess. What what has it meant or what do you see or what have you observed that you didn't think was going to be the way the world was going to work? Hmm. I think I, I was watching the the Brian Solis episode you did. There there's, you know, it accelerated a lot of the changes that were already coming. So so that that was kind of expected, but I, I think like like everything like it happened overnight so th like a lot of the changes that happened i thought oh this will happen over the next 10 years it was like bang um a couple other things for me you know i kind of feel like for businesses it, it was literally this sort of random coin flip and you were either on the side of the coin where your business got more relevant or you're on the side of the coin where it's like you got to figure something else out quick and and kind of nothing in between, and so so that's that's been kind of fascinating. Then then well, so because I have a video technology, I've been doing a daily video diary of what it's like to be an extrovert in isolation. And I mm. thought I would be doing it for three or four weeks. I just did episode one hundred and forty seven, and like it's you know it's been months, and like I don't see any end in it anytime soon. I don't see. I think I don't see anybody. Nobody talking. Oh to my me. god! Yeah, it's just crazy. <laughs> and then, and then the last one, I just I shared this on my daily diary, where I think the biggest thing for me is it took me a couple of months to realize this that the lack of physical interaction means that you don't have these kind of phases, these mile markers where something is is different. Like if I was going to go to an event in Philadelphia, like a three-day conference, you know, you would go to the airport, you would get on the plane, you'd go there, you'd have the experience in the hotel, like physically something changed. And, and what's going on now is that like the distinction between going to an online conference, doing a live TV show with Chris Brogan, getting a client, losing a client, they're all identical from an experiential standpoint. You're sitting at your desk, you're, you're either on the phone or on a camera or, or sending emails. So there's like nothing that's, that's sort of regulating for me mentally because of the lack of physical changes. So for me, that, that's been a recent insight. And, and I don't know what to do with it because I don't know quite how to change it uh, other than I go out and then when I go out, I feel uncomfortable because some people aren't wearing masks and there's aggressive right. weirdness and fights. And wow. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to stay in. So right. I, I yeah, know. stay in. <laughs> but Kelly, you had said that you were relaunching your career in adult content and that it was the pandemic was like the worst time. It might be like a pretty good time because it wasn't all yeah. of a sudden like consumption of that kind of content was up. It's, a lot. it's a good time because these platforms exist. You know, if the platforms didn't exist, I'd be like, well, I guess I'm just going to go back to doing PR, uh, <laughs> which, which I still do. But um, but I had really wanted to come back to content creation. Uh, and and we had made plans of like after the January award show season that I would be making announcement. And and that didn't happen. Um, but we're now also experiencing kind of like what Kyle says, we're, we're you know, AVN just announced that they're going to be doing their first virtual award show and conference um, in January. So, you know, especially on this on the heels of CES shutting down this year. So yeah, I think that's going to be the next like interesting thing to watch because I've never seen a fully uh, successful virtual adult conference mm -hmm. um, yet. Um, I've seen, I've been, I've attended industry only conferences where it's mostly panel discussions and workshops and things like that. But when you include the fans, I don't know what that looks like. So I'm really excited to see what January is going to look like in terms of mm -hmm. ABN. I'm sure they're all tearing their hair out right now, trying to figure out how to make it work correctly. Um, 
but you know, I'm, I'm the opposite of Kyle in that I'm an introvert during the quarantine. So, uh, so you're great. You're like, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> I'm doing fine. But on a business <laughs> level, it's definitely uh, a little bit more of an uphill battle for me to try to figure out how to reach my fans in the way they want to be approached. Right. Um, so yeah, <laughs> so that's kind of my, my hurdle right now. Kelly, it was funny when you were saying something about making an announcement, I was planning on making an announcement. You're kind of of the last generation of people who an announcement, like someone would give a shit about an announcement. I was just thinking like, you know, all these like, you know, the, the, and, and, it, and it, it sounds, it sounds like I'm demeaning them and I kind of am, but I'm saying like, they're all just like a bunch of little people that we don't really know. And that, you know, they have their fans and they have their bases and they're doing as well or not as air, but but you're a performer that people pay attention to and that gets clocked in the news, gets written up in magazines all over the place. You're kind of the cutoff of that generation, aren't you? I, I think I might be. Um, but also when I say announcement, I only mean like within the industry. So it's sure, sure. more of a call out. It's more of a call. You're not to talking out. to Anderson Cooper. I get it. but you know. <laughs> it's, more to, it's more of like a press release that goes out. That's a call to action for like directors and, and producers to go, Oh, she's available again. It's less, it's less for the fans. Um, with the fans, the only thing I had really had to do was launch my only fans and a couple of other platforms and make an announcement on Twitter that I was back and, and they came and are, have been amazingly supportive. So how big sure. a problem is scraping of content? Like you see Reddit and you see all these other places where people just rip content oh, and re-upload it. That's, it that's kind of what I mean is, um, the last time Brogan, when you and I actually you know, went to inbound marketing summit and a couple of those other yeah. web conferences, that was like the beginning of like tube sites and a lot of piracy happening and, mm -hmm. and, pe and people in the industry try to figure out, trying to figure out their way around how to work around that. Whereas now it's less about the producers trying to figure out their workarounds. It's more about every single content creator trying to figure out what works best for them. Um, I think, you know, OnlyFans, I think has been only like, they, they've been around for less than five years, I think. Um, or they've been, or they're right at the five-year mark, and so I think we're still in that infancy of trying to figure out what's the what's the the biggest site that we should all be on. What site can offer everything at once? So we're not asking our fans to go to seven different sites to get all of our content. Right. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because that's a very similar thing probably that Kyle had to deal with a lot and that I know I've had to answer a million different times, which is what's the next site after Twitter? Who cares? I don't mm -hmm. care. In yours, there's a kind of reason why aggregation matters. Kyle, that's why you've built yours to be, we can put it wherever we can put it. You know, that's how it's built, right? Yeah. And, you know, what we're focusing on is the content creation, less about the distribution. But if I if I kind of, you know, look at my crystal ball about how Storyvine evolves, I, I think we increasingly will have to have a complete product, which probably does include distribution or at least includes you know, much, much deeper hooks and, and sort of back channels from distri distribution platforms so that from our platform, you can see how things are performing out in the world. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think that, um, I, I think it's all evolving. I mean, the real fact of the matter is no one knows anything right now. And because of the pandemic, it's even less so. But just if, if you go back and just look at kind of the, the evolution of blogging, when blogging came out, you know, journalists were like, that's not real journalism, real, you know, th there was this whole. <laughs> that's how they said it too. Yeah, that's how they said it. Said it. Yeah. <laughs> But but bloggers were just you know these, these hacks and, and and then that evolved and journalists started blogging and all of a sudden it, it gained some credibility so I think you see these cycles of something new comes into the scene everyone kind of poo poos it and you know I remember when, when the Grammys the the head of the Grammys came out I don't this is probably in the early two thousands or late nineties but he came out and said you evil kids you know downloading our music you're ruining the industry you know this is pre-streaming right and now the industry's evolved so so i think i think kelly's right that that the, kind of the evolution of this we kind of don't know where we are that we will see these things sort of rise and fall but you know the old models are gone and i just we just don't quite know what the new models look like yet so i think everyone is in this state of trying to figure it out and oh, and, and, the uh, kids, be. And, and the young kids have a you know and, and that makes me obviously the old person um <laughs> They they know all the platforms before we do. Like for us, yeah. it's like to go back and trying to learn a new language. Whereas like the kids who have been like on Vine and TikTok, they've got it all figured out, you know. And so for us, it's more like 
can you teach us? That would be great. They get yeah. immediately snotty too. If a, if a platform is like kind of five minutes ago right. and you mention uh, it, they're like, ugh, no not, reason no. That anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That was, Twitter. That was amazing. That, 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 oh, sorry, Kelly, go ahead. You've seen people who actively are are vocal about their complaints about specific platforms. You've seen, you know, occasional mm. bursts of complaints about OnlyFans and occasional bursts of complaints about other platforms. And other content uh, platform developers are reading all of those and, and trying to adapt those to their new platforms. But we're also, you know, in the infancy now, again, of like trying to figure out where we can advertise our product. Um, you know, FOSTA SESTA has been a huge burr in our side because it's prevented, um, it's kind of pushed us back into the old school. You can only advertise in certain zones of, of the town. Whereas when Twitter first came uh, out and Facebook, zone, everybody was like, oh, it's like a free for all. We can now advertise in the main public market marketplace. And now with FOSTA SESTA, you know, um, even even mainstream writers are being um, throttled from how much sex and relationship writing they can do. So there's not you don't see as much of the glut of interviews that you used to see in mainstream, like on Cosmo or Rolling Stone with mm -hmm. adult entertainers because the writers have been let go. Wow. You know, so yeah. uh, so for us, we're now learning, like like Carrie was saying, like learning how to advertise on Reddit, learning how to advertise on different social media platforms, and hoping that those don't get deplatformed or uh, demonetized for adult content creators. It's a little like cannabis, yeah. huh? You got to like dance yeah. around it. Yeah. You got to call it something oh, else. It's nuts. It's very much like that. You're totally right. All right. Listen, it's that, it's that time of the show. The show's almost over. Uh, this is where we talk a little bit about what goes in the backpack for the next five years. One or two people have ever taken something back out of the backpack, but you're invited to put something in. My five things that'll come in my upcoming book about the backpack are story, collaboration, autonomy. You know, you have to kind of make the world your own. Manchu, an Okinawan word that means one family. Not a Japanese word I found out by every Japanese speaking friend I have. Execution, things that one has to do. So those are mine. Kyle, Shannon, I guess let's start with you. What's something that we should put in the backpack for people to use for the next five years? What one trait or idea or thought should they be moving forward? I, It kind of you lives know, inside story but but it's it's authenticity oh, okay and, and it's it's sh sharing less what you think people want to see because you want to find that audience and just sharing what's authentic to you because your audience will find you and and i think there are increasing you know i, I think we're seeing more and more of this um but it's also really hard. It's really scary to be to be authentic. So it's that Brene Brown vulnerability thing. But but I think when it comes to self expression, doing it from an authentic place, not a place of where you think you need to do it for for this audience or that. It's just do it, and the audience will find you. That's so funny, Kyle, because somebody just asked me, "What is it about being a visible influencer? Like, how do you talk to your, you know, how do you attract mm -hmm. your target audience?" And I said, "Oh my God, who the hell cares?" And she was so shocked. And I was like, "You just do your thing, and your audience yeah. finds you." Yeah, exactly. I'm not gonna like tap dance for some audience I think I want. Yeah, I'm gonna have and, to completely uh, agree with Kyle because, like, if you, I'm not encouraging people to sign up for my OnlyFans, although that would be fantastic. Um, <laughs> Half of my content has nothing to do with what you would consider traditional porn. I have baking right. videos. I have me doing <laughs> yoga. I have me, you know, um, they may be sexier than what you would see on YouTube because I might be wearing a bikini top. But um, but it's really is more about being authentic and showing a side of you that that fans can connect with. That's not just, oh, I had, you know, um, I was aroused and I needed to see your stuff so I can get there, you know, so. Although that's how they want to, that's what they want to connect with. So well, there's with that them. too. <laughs> you know, if, if, especially with those kinds of platforms, if you're putting up content every single day or multiple times a day, you know, there's a threshold where like that becomes overkill. And fans, I think, like Kyle was saying, really want to connect to you as a, as a person mm -hmm. these days, especially like the current generation of, of um, the, the new adult consumers. They really want to connect with the person that they're spending their money on. Um, in a way that's not just, oh, I signed up for a subscription to Playboy TV. It's interesting, you know, just a sort of last thought on that is that it's interesting how there's this split in the road between people really wanting real, real and things like Belle Delphine, uh, you know, where it's clearly not real and it's clearly like ridiculously not real. But a lot of people don't know who she is, but she looks like she should be porn, but she's not. She's like making fun of. 
she's she's teasing she's teasing yeah. the trolls basically she's uh she exists in this space where uh men who get mostly men who get uh, really hyped up on porn think that every female in any context is you know just that close to being porn and so she's decided to you know profit off that in a humorous way but it's just interesting it's interesting because what kelly says is true watching her bake would be someone's really good content and watching bell do weird things with gamer bathwater and all that is yeah. also someone's really good so that's how we get it done i think you know. i think there's there's um the, because we're seeing this kind of content, sort of the self-produced thing, even on network TV now, you can spy something that's not real, like more immediately than Absolutely. you've ever been able to. So, so I, I think there, I think part of it is, is also just, you know, if you're bullshitting, you're going to get sniffed out. We yeah. need a term for that. It's like the uncanny Valley, isn't it? It's like the bit. uncanny Valley. Yeah. Yeah. But there's also, you know, an obligation on the performer side to, to share with their fans what is uh, what is real real and what is fantasy mm -hmm. real, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. And saying that, hey, we can we can do both things. I have fans mm -hmm. that want me to dress up in a panda onesie and, and do things for them as much as I have fans who really enjoy just watching me stretch and do yoga. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, how you eat a banana is probably a lot different. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah, for, for real, either real, group. Fantasy real. Yeah. yeah. It's a, a lot of it is really just seeing how each consumer wants to consume and how they want to interact. And everybody mm -hmm. is different. I think that's the biggest lesson that you learn that I've learned since not working in, within the studio system is that everybody wants something different. That's interesting. Well, that makes me think of a, another really interesting,